Right, we're here in John chapter 14, and the main theme of this, this chapter is really about the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. That's why we sang that song. We will talk about a few other things, but we want to really focus on the Holy Ghost here tonight. And obviously, as you're going through the book of John, you can talk about salvation every single sermon. But, you know, it kind of gets old after a while. It's like, all right, we're saved. And yeah, we preach the gospel all the time. We, we know all about salvation. So we're going to cover some different things tonight. But uh, look at John chapter 14. Let's start at verse number 1 where the Bible reads, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Now, I want you to understand something as we're going through this chapter because there's a lot of verses we could spend a lot of time on. But we'll spend some time on them. This chapter really makes a huge difference between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. There are very clear differences mentioned throughout the chapter. And yet in the same chapter, you're going to look at one verse later on that you know the oneness crowd really likes to highlight and make a big deal out. Now, look, let me make it very clear. There's a clear distinction made of all three of them. Okay? It starts in verse number one. We'll talk later on about that verse, but I just want to let you know real right up front that this really is a chapter that destroys oneness. Yeah. There are so many verses that just completely show a distinction between them. And so you can't allow one verse that you don't fully understand or people could have different opinions on. You can't let one verse throw you. Okay, In the first verse, you believe in God, believe also in me. Okay, So he's saying you believe in God, now believe also in me. That's not saying Jesus is not God. But you know there's God the Father, there's God the Son, there's God the Holy Ghost. Obviously we believe that. Verse number two. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Okay. Now the word you in the Bible is plural. Okay. You and ye, those are plural words. The ones that start with why. The these and the thous, those are the singular words. You know the great mystery of understanding the King James Bible. I just solved it there. Okay. <laughs> you and ye are plural. The and thou are singular. But it's very important that you don't just have this generic word you for everything. You say, why? Because you can make a difference between what's being said. When it says you, he's clearly saying plural. Okay. When you just have a generic word like you that can mean either plural or singular, it makes it a little bit more confusing. Yeah. The King James was written in a very poetic way. and It was written with very good grammar to really help us understand what's being said. When he says, I go to prepare a place for you, he's talking to multiple people. Because you is plural, okay? He says you, so he's talking about plural. So he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. A is singular, though. So he's preparing one place for a lot of people, okay? He's not saying, hey, I'm preparing one place for you and one place for you. No, he's preparing a place for a lot of different people, okay? And so... Look at verse number three. I'll show you why this is, is kind of, it's not really important, but it's kind of interesting. Verse three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. So in verse number two, he talked about there being many mansions, but he's preparing a place, okay? So when he says a place, he's not talking about all of these mansions because that would be plural. A place is one. He prepared a place for all of the mansions, okay? All of the mansions are going to one place because a place is singular, you is plural, and many mansions, that's plural, okay? Now turn to John 2. I'll show you what I'm talking about. John 2. Because usually when people look at this, they kind of focus on this and they say, well, you know, what he's basically saying is I prepared a mansion for you, Brother Ehrman, a mansion for you, Brother Sean Lee, a mansion for you, Brother Dustin. What I believe is being said, and we're, we're going to see some verses that would explain this, I believe the mansion is actually referring to your body. And basically he's preparing a place. Heaven is prepared for each of our bodies. Okay. Now I'll tell you, we'll look at John chapter 2. John 2. And by the way, this is the only time you see mansion mentioned in the Bible. Okay. There's not a ton of time. So if we're going to understand what mansion is talking about from John 14, you look at John 14, that's when you see the word mansion. Okay. John 2, verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So he describes his body as a temple, and naturally the Jews think he's talking about a building. And they say this building took 46 years to build, and you're going to build it in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Okay? And so what he's doing is referring to his body as a temple. It's not strange to think that your body could be referring to the mansion. Because your body is referred to as the temple throughout the Bible. The Bible says our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now turn back to John 14. 
Turn back to John 14. Now, here's the reason, one big reason why everybody thinks this is referring to us having a literal mansion, like a house with lots of gold and lots of silver. One of the big reasons why is because I've got a mansion. It's a nice song, but that doesn't mean that the song's accurate, right? Just a little silver, a little gold. Just because that was a song written, it's not a bad song. I don't think it's, you know, I enjoy the song. We've sung it at this church before. That doesn't mean that what they're teaching in there is 100% accurate. This is the only time you see mansion mentioned in the Bible. And, and here's the thing about this. You know why we have a house or why you have a house that you live in? You need a house to protect you from the rain. You need a house to protect you from the sun. When we're in heaven, we don't need to be protected from the rain. We don't need to be protected from the sun. We have a house here on earth because we need it. It's a necessity to have protection. Okay? You're not going to need that in heaven. And so honestly, you know, what would honestly be the purpose of having, you know, a giant house? Now, look, if some people believe that, you in this room might believe that it's referring to an actual building. That's fine. That's what most people do. Maybe you're right. But, you know, honestly, I think it makes sense, more sense that it's referring to our bodies because our bodies are mentioned as the temple of the Holy Ghost. So our bodies are referred to as being a temple. It's not weird that it would be referred to as a mansion. This is the only mention of mansion, and I guess I just don't really see what would be the big purpose of having a literal house and a mansion up in heaven. There's no real purpose for it, okay? So when he's saying, I prepare a place, he's talking about singular. So he's pre preparing a place for all of the mansions. Now, you could think that mansion's referring to a literal building, and that's fine. I think the, the a place is being prepared for our bodies. We're going to have glorified bodies up in heaven, okay? Now, look back at John chapter 14, John 14. And if you can believe you know, that it's referring to building, that's fine. You know, I, I can't really be dogmatic because it's not really like 2 plus 2 equals 4. But I think it makes more sense that it's referring to our bodies because we're not going to worry about snow up in heaven. And you guys don't worry. We, we don't worry about snow anyway here in the Philippines. We're not going to worry about rain up in heaven. Okay, We're not worrying about getting – if I go outside without a hat, without a hat soul winning for a couple hours, I will be sunburned all over. Okay, I'm very maputi, Okay, My skin cannot take it. But you know, up in heaven, we're not going to have the need for a house to protect us. Okay. Now look at John 14, verse 4. The Bible reads, And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Okay. Now Jesus makes it very clear that where I'm going, you, you know that, and the way you know. Now look, you cannot go to heaven unless you know how to get there. He's saying you have saved people, you got to know the way. Okay? Now look, I've heard Calvinists preach, and they say, you know, you can get saved and not even realize you got saved. Because God can just, bam, regenerate you, and you have no idea it even happened. Okay? What in the world kind of nonsense is that? You have to know the way. You have to know where you're going. Nobody's going to get saved if they have no idea that it's through Jesus Christ. They have no idea that they're going to heaven. They don't even know what heaven is. Oh, I, I thought you got reincarnated. Look, they can't get saved. They have to understand where they're going, they have to understand how is the way that you get there. And Jesus makes it very clear where I, whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. You cannot be saved unless you know the actual way to get there. Okay? Look, you can't, you say, well, you know, someone's just kind of confused. You know, they think that, you know, you get to heaven through Muhammad. They think you get to heaven through Buddha. But they still believe in Jesus. They don't know the way. Yeah. You must clearly know the way in order to be saved. You must understand it's salvation by grace through faith, and it's only in Jesus Christ. You cannot believe that there's multiple ways. All roads lead to Rome, they say, right? Look, all roads, all religions don't lead to heaven. Yeah. The only religion that leads to heaven is belief on Jesus Christ, believing right. on him alone. You must know the way. Now, notice what it says in verse 5. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Now, Jesus made it very clear in verse 4 that if you're saved, you do know the way. Okay? Now, I believe Thomas is saved. Okay? But Thomas doesn't necessarily understand what Jesus is talking about. He understands the way to heaven that is by faith alone. He understands he's going to heaven. He understands it's through Jesus Christ. But he doesn't necessarily understand what Jesus just said. Okay? And so he says, you know, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? What it sounds like to me is that Thomas wants to get kind of more information about heaven. He's like, I want to know about this place. He's like, we don't know where you're going. Just tell us about it. Okay, now turn to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12.
Now, here's the truth about this. We do know the way to heaven, and we know where we're going, but honestly, we don't really know a whole lot about heaven. The Bible does not talk about heaven that much. Now, there's a lot of things I like to think of in my mind, like, for example, they, they say that there's, there's many colors in the spectrum that we cannot actually see, and there's going to be new colors in heaven. You know, that's a nice thought, and you know, it, it makes sense to me that's probably true, but we don't know if that's true. There's not like there's a verse in the Bible that says you will see, you know, this and this and this. I mean, we don't really know what heaven's going to be like, okay? The Bible's pretty vague, and you say, why? Well, in 2 Corinthians 12, it kind of gives us an idea why he's vague about it. Okay, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1. And what you need to understand is that if we could fully comprehend heaven in our human state, it wouldn't really be heaven. Okay? It's going to be something that we cannot fully comprehend here as humans. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. Now, when it says third heaven here... The Mormons will go around and say, well, see, there's levels of heaven. If you're like a, a, a bad Mormon, you go to the first heaven. Okay? Or, or if you're like not that good of a person. But if you're kind of a better Mormon or a better person, you go to the second heaven. If you're really good, though, you get to go to the third heaven. You get all these wives and stuff like that. And so they, they, they make a distinction here between different levels of getting of heaven. The Bible says third heaven. What you have to understand is that there's only one heaven in terms of where humans will dwell after they die as believers. Okay? What was understood was the atmosphere was referred to as a heaven. I mean, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay? And then you see you know, distinctions made there. So when it's talking about third heaven, it's talking about where we go as believers when we die to be with the Lord. And it says, such an one caught up to the third heaven. Now, people have different opinions on who this is referring to, okay? He says, I knew a man. It does not tell you who that man is, okay? So we cannot necessarily be 100% sure who that man is referring to, okay? Now, what I believe and what most people believe is that Paul is referring to himself. That is what I believe, okay? And I'll give you my reasons here in a second. But we can't know this for sure. This is one of those topics where it's okay to have different opinions. Okay, because it doesn't say, I knew a man and his name is John the Baptist. I knew a man and his name is Elijah. It just says, I knew a man. We don't know who that man is. And so honestly, we could be opinionated either way. And, and you know what? We're going to find out in heaven one day who was right, I guess. We don't really necessarily know. But it says in verse 3, I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for man to utter. Now, honestly, the big reason why I think Paul's referring to himself is because it says he heard unspeakable words. That means these things couldn't be spoken. If somebody else went to heaven, that person could not tell Paul about it. All he could tell Paul is, hey, I went up to heaven, but I can't tell you about it. Okay? I don't think Paul would repeat that. And I think that would be kind of weird. Honestly, I would have trouble believing someone if they told me, hey, by the way, I went to heaven, but I can't tell you about it. Okay, I, I wouldn't believe them. Even if they were a godly person, I'd be like, you had a dream or something. You know? But Paul says, you know, heard unspeakable words, which is, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So if this is somebody else who went to heaven, all they were able to tell Paul was, hey, I went to heaven, but I can't tell you about it at all. Because it's unspeakable words. Okay? And honestly, you could possibly even argue unspeakable. He couldn't even really say that he, he went there, I guess. I don't know. But I believe Paul's referring to himself. And he's saying, you know what, I, I saw these great things, but I can't really repeat them to you. I think that makes more sense than someone else saw it, but, you know, people have different opinions, and that's fine. One thing to notice here in verse number four is this, where it says paradise, okay? See, paradise and heaven are referred to as the same place in the Bible. Now, I know there are some people that seem to think that paradise is a word for the non-burning part of hell, <laughs> but you're not going to find that anywhere in the Bible. Yeah. Paradise is being in heaven. Okay? It's not a gray area in the Bible. It says how he was caught up into paradise. And what people will say is, well, paradise was moved to heaven. It used to be right there with hell. Okay? <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but if we go out soul winning and tell people, hey, you know what? You get to go to paradise. And guess what? You know, it's, it's right by hell. It's going to be very close to being burning. Okay? You say, oh, Brother Stuck, you know, people go to heaven now. So, yeah, but guess what? So many existed in the Old Testament. Yeah. And so what did they tell people in the Old Testament then? 
Hey, guess what? We all go to hell. Don't worry. It's the good part of hell. <laughs> the non-burning part of hell. I mean, does that make any sense? Can you imagine your soul winning presentation <laughs> in, the old, in the Old Testament? Because I tell people that when you die, you either go to heaven or hell. But apparently in the Old Testament, you say, hey, when you die, you're going to go to hell. But there's a good part and there's a bad part. Don't worry. Eventually, the Lord will take you up into heaven. <laughs> but you got to be there in hell for a little while. Okay, that, that's ridiculous. And you're never going to see that in the Bible. So we do see that heaven and paradise are used synonymously here in the Bible. And so when people died in the Old Testament, they went to heaven or they went to paradise. Now turn back to John 14. Back to John 14. And so we've already looked at a few things that honestly people could have different opinions on. You know, if you don't believe that's referring to Paul, that's fine. Or if you think the mansions are literal buildings, there are a lot of things in the Bible that quite honestly we cannot necessarily be dogmatic about. Okay? Now, what will happen is that people will look at something that, you know, we can't be dogmatic about. Like, let's say, for example, the end times. Is the end times confusing? A little bit. Are there some things that, honestly, people could have a million different opinions? Absolutely. And they'll use something like that and say, well, see, we can't really know the end times. Therefore, you don't know when Jesus is coming back. Hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that everything in the end times is complicated. Look, the, the book of Revelation is confusing. The book of Daniel, there's a lot of confusing parts that I don't understand. But, you know, I do know what after the tribulation means. Yeah. That's not just a, a documentary movie title. That's actually words from the Holy Bible. Yeah. In Matthew 24, after the tribulation. Okay? So, just because the end times is confusing, there's one part that's not confusing about it. And that is when Jesus is coming back. Whether it's before or after the tribulation. And it's very clear he's coming after the tribulation. You say, but I don't think God's people are pointed on the wrath. I agree with you. The tribulation and God's wrath are different. Mm -hmm. Just look up tribulation throughout the Bible, and it's God's people going through persecutions, afflictions, tribulations. The wrath of God, we're not appointed on the wrath. The unbelievers are appointed on the wrath. And when people die and go to hell forever, he that believeth not the Son shall not see light, but the wrath of God abideth not. Yes, we as believers are not appointed on the wrath, okay? But unbelievers, they are. But we do go through tribulation. We do go through persecution. Look, I mean, and this isn't really persecution, but, you know, Sean Lee and I were kicked out of the apartment complex. Look, you know what? The message we're presenting, people don't always like. And it's a lesson to us when someone starts saying, Brother Soriano, Brother Soriano, Brother Soriano. It's like, that guy's probably going to hate us. Okay? <laughs> Look at John 14, verse 6, where the Bible reads, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And this is one of the great verses in the Bible that shows Jesus is the only way to heaven. Okay? Now, notice how he says the way. Notice how he says the truth. Notice how he says the life. Look, when you look at these other religions, Islam is not truth. It's complete lies. It's yeah. completely false. Buddhism is completely false. You say, but they believe in following good morals as well. No, it's all false. All of it's false. Look, the devil said a lot of true things in the Bible, but when you mix in some lies with it, it makes everything said false. The only truth is the Word of God is Jesus Christ. All these other religions, they're false. Okay. Now look, Jesus himself said he is the way to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If he's lying about this, he's the worst human being who ever lived. Look. Everyone in this room has lied, but I have never gone around telling people that I'm the way to heaven. I've never told people that I'm eternal life. And if I said that to someone, that would make me an evil, crazy person. And if Jesus is lying about this, he's a really evil person. Now look, the only that really leaves only two religions that, that make sense. And that is what we believe in Judaism. Because at least with Judaism, they say Jesus was a devil-worshipping liar. Right? That's what they say about it. The Jews hate Jesus Christ. At least what they say makes sense, though. What doesn't make sense is to say that he was a good teacher, but he wasn't God. Right. Yeah. He was really good, but he wasn't the way. If he wasn't the way, he's the most evil man who ever lived. Just believe like the Jews do then. It does not make sense to say he was a good teacher or a good prophet, but he wasn't truly the only way to heaven. Yeah. Either was or he wasn't. He said he was the only way to heaven. Verse 7. And once again, he notices, you notice the distinction made between the Father and the Son. Okay. Now, verse number 7 if he had known me, he should have known my father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, 
show us the Father and it suffices us. Now, I want you to understand that Philip has been trying to get more information about heaven, more information about God. And, you know, honestly, there's only so much you're going to be able to learn here in our human state. We're not going to be able to fully get it here on earth. And he said in verse number 8, show us the Father. Now turn to Exodus 33. Exodus 33. Now, have people seen Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Have they seen the Father? Well, let's see what it says in Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33, verse 18. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face. For there shall no man see me and live. No one's going to see him and live. Now, did people see Jesus Christ? Absolutely. In fact, a lot of people saw him after he rose again. Plenty of people saw Jesus Christ, but what they did not see was God the Father. Okay? Why? No man can see the face of the Father and live. Okay? You're not going to be able to see him. That's what it says in Exodus 33. Now, turn back to John 14. John 14. And the reason why I've said this is because of the fact, and verse number 9 is a, is a pretty debated topic. And look, the Bible is just very clear in this chapter that there's a distinct distinction between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But I'll be honest with you, I don't believe verse 9 is saying what most people think it is from what I've heard people talk about in verse number 9. And I'll show you why here in a second. Verse 9, though, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Now, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay? Now, the oneness crowd uses this, and they say, well, see, Jesus is the Father. Well, there's so many verses in this chapter that would tell you he's not the Father. Yeah. We've already seen several of them. Okay? But I'll tell you what, I do not believe that this is actually saying in this verse that Jesus looks like the Father. I don't believe that. Now, I do believe Jesus looks like the Father, but I don't believe that's what this verse is saying. Because if you go to Colossians 1, who is the image of the invisible God? Okay? He's the express image of his person. I don't think that's what it's saying in this verse, though. And the reason why I don't think it's saying this is go, go to verse number 10. Verse 10 and 11, I'll explain here. Verse 10 and 11. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So if you look at verses 10 and 11, what Jesus is saying is, I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. Now, look, the Holy Ghost is inside of me. That doesn't mean that I look like the Holy Ghost. Right? The Lord's inside of me. It doesn't mean that I look like the Lord. I really don't think even the purpose of what Thomas was saying was specifically what does the Father look like. I think he's trying to get more information about God and the afterlife and things like that. And what Jesus says is, hey, I'm in the Father and the Father in me. I've always taken verse 9 through my life as just a proof that Jesus is God. Basically because, you know, you really can't separate Jesus from God. Now, there's a distinction between God the Son and God the Father, but it's not like they're at enmity with one another. It's not like they hate one another. He's like, I'm in the Father, and the Father in me. So I think he clarifies in these next verses, verses 10 and 11, where he's saying, I'm in the Father, and the Father in me. Don't you believe this? I don't think that's specifically saying, though, in verse number 9, that I look like the Father. Now, I do believe that he's express image of his person. But in the context of the verses before and after, I've always just looked at it as a proof that Jesus is God. I haven't looked at it as a proof that he's God the Father specifically, and there's no God the Son. Though. Okay? There's plenty of verses in this chapter that would specifically make a distinction, and we haven't even come to the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is going to come to this chapter, and there's a clear distinction between all of them. Now, let's look at John chapter 14. And he said in verse number 11, or else believe me for the very work's sake. See, the works of Jesus proclaim that he proceeded forth from the Father. Okay? His works were made it very evident who he was. Verse number 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now, verse number 12 is an amazing verse because even though Jesus you know, fed the multitudes, even though he healed people and did all these miracles— even though he did works that were undeniable. I mean, he told John the Baptist's disciples, hey, go back and, back and show them again the works that I've done. 
Because those show that he proceeded forth from the Father. Those show that he's God the Son. Those show that he's the Savior. But then he says that we're going to do greater works than these. Okay? Now that doesn't mean that I'm going to go out to Resolve Park and feed thousands of people. Okay? It doesn't mean I'm going to go down the street healing people. But you have to realize that we're able to accomplish quite a bit in today's world. Yeah. Look, you know, through the online ministry, do you realize how many people listen to sermons online that live on the other side of the world? I mean, you realize you can advertise a, a soul winning marathon or soul winning missions trip in Manila and have, like, people from all over the world show up. Now, look, in, in, in Jesus' day, yes, crowds followed him, but it's not like he could make a social media announcement that, hey, we're going to have this missions trip in Manila on this date and have over 100 people show up. But in today's world, we're able to accomplish that. I mean, today's world, you can announce a soul winning event, and then in every state throughout the nation at the same time, you know, in the United States and all over the world, there's so many marathons taking place. We're able to accomplish quite a lot in this day. Now, the day we live in is honestly the most sinful and wicked day probably since, you know, the, the, the flood. Quite honestly, you know, worldwide, it's probably more wicked than it's ever been except of before the flood took place. But, you know, honestly, in today's world, we were able to accomplish more. You have to understand that it, as, as it gets darker and darker, a light's going to shine brighter. Yeah. Okay? A light's not going to be that bright if it's bright outside already. You're not going to notice that. But as the world gets really dark, we as, as shining lights, as we see in Matthew 5, 16, we're going to shine really brightly in that darkness. And in today's world, we're honestly able to accomplish quite a bit that people have never been able to. And look, honestly, there have been people that have been much better people than us that have lived, you know, great men of God, but they could only accomplish so much. In today's world, we're able to accomplish quite a lot. It's a great time to live. Verse number 13. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Verse number 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Now, this is a verse I've heard quoted by people often to say that you have to do good works to get to heaven. Okay. Now, the only way I can understand this is that for most people, it's hard to memorize long verses. So this is kind of as long as it gets. It's like, if you love me, keep my commandments. Those seven words I can memorize, and that will be it. Look, he doesn't say to go to heaven, keep my commandments. Yeah. He doesn't say to be saved, keep my commandments. He doesn't say, you know, all he says is, if you love me, keep my commandments. Who said you have to love God in order to go to heaven? Yeah. Where does it say that in the Bible? You say, well, of course you have to love God. Well, show me that in the Bible. Because everything I believe I can prove from the Bible. Mm -hmm. This is our basis for what we believe. Show me where it says you have to love God to go to heaven. You say, but wait a minute. You know, the Calvinists say that a saved person loves God and an unsaved person hates God. Show me that in the Bible. Here it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. See, the proof of whether or not you love God is if you keep his commandments. Yeah. The proof of whether or not you're saved is what you believe. Okay, Whether or not you keep his commandments has nothing to do with getting to heaven. Okay? And honestly, if keeping his commandments was the prerequisite to getting to heaven, then I guess none of us are going. Right. Because I have not kept all of his commandments. I'm not perfect, so how many of them do I need to keep? Is it okay if I've just never murdered anyone and do ever, done everything else? Or, I mean, does it matter how many times I break them? You know, if I've, I've, if I've lied only like 50 times in my life. Now, where is the cutoff? It does not make logical sense. Okay, He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And honestly, I quote this verse sometimes out so many myself and just tell them, hey, the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Not to go to heaven, keep my commandments. The Bible does not say you have to love God in order to go to heaven. But what the Bible does say is that the only person who can truly love God is someone who is saved. Yeah. Okay. Amen. So that is true. But that doesn't mean that everyone who's saved loves God. Quite honestly, most saved people do not love God. Okay? You say, how do you know that? Because most saved people don't go soul winning. Yeah. Most saved people don't read the Bible. Most saved people live a worldly life. And if they really love God, the proof would be in the pudding. Everyone would be able to see it. They'd be keeping his commandments. But if they don't keep his commandments, guess what? They don't love God. That's what the Bible teaches. Verse number 16. And I will pray the Father... And he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now, once again in verse number 16, we're seeing all three mentioned. It's Jesus speaking, he says the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Now, I want you to turn to John 15. John 15. Verse number 
I mean, you see these people that they say they love God, and they're really respected Baptist pastors, and they're going to Japan, let's say, to preach at some you know big Baptist convention, and then they take a picture, and then of course they're wearing Disney gear and everything on the plane, <laughs> and it's just like you say, did that happen? Yeah, you know, check Facebook. Check Facebook last night, and it's just like, wow, you're really respected, and there you are. And it's like, you know, everything comes from the sovereignty of God. And then it's like, you know, why are you living a worldly life? And you're taking that picture on Facebook. You're obviously not ashamed about it, and yet you're the most respected Baptist, Bible Baptist here in the Philippines. And it's just like, you know, yeah, you really look like you love God. If you love God, you're going to keep his commandments and live a godly and holy life. John 15, verse 26, but when the Comforter has come... Whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. You say, why are we going to John 15 to look at the Comforter? Because Muslims believe that in John 14, verse 16, where he says he shall give you another Comforter, Muslims believe that Jesus was referring, referring to Muhammad. That's what they believe. They believe that some of these verses were mistranslated and misquoted, but that Jesus spoke about a Comforter because Muslims believe Jesus was a prophet. They believe in five great prophets, and Muhammad was the final one. Moses, Noah, man, I'm, I'm missing one. Jesus, Muhammad, there's one other one. Abraham, there we go. Those, those five, he knows all the false prophets. That's the category in the Bible church we're never going to get them on. But um, they believe that Muhammad was the final one, but they believe Jesus was a prophet. So they believe a lot of what he said was misunderstood or mistranslated, misquoted, or whatever. But they believe Jesus talked about the comforter coming, and they believe that's referring to Muhammad. Okay? Well, there's a few problems with that referring to Muhammad. In John 15, verse 26, when he says, The Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify. Okay, now, first off, being the Spirit of truth would imply that you're just 100% true. Now, Muslims don't even claim Muhammad was perfect. Yeah. Okay. Now they, they it's amazing how they don't claim he was perfect and yet, you know, being married to like a, a five year old. Mm -hmm. Oh, he didn't consummate till he was nine. But they don't think that's wrong. It's like, wow, you got a weird standard of right and wrong. Okay? But they don't claim he was perfect. Well, here it said the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth that implies perfection. Okay? But notice what it says, proceedeth from the Father. Look, Muhammad didn't proceed from the Father. Yeah. He didn't come from the Father. Okay? They don't even claim he came from the Father. They don't claim that he's literally God. They don't claim that he was dwelling up in heaven. In what way do they believe he proceeded from the Father? They believe he was just a really good man, a really good prophet, because they don't think there's any deity in Abraham, Noah, Moses, or Jesus, or Muhammad. They don't. They just believe that, you know, well, he was a really good man. He came from Mecca. Turn to John 8. John 8. So when the Bible says the Comforter proceeds from the Father, look, Jesus, the Son, the, the Son of God, the Holy Ghost, and God the Father, they existed from eternity past. They've always existed. Okay? It, when, when the virgin birth came, Jesus Christ does not have a physical father. Why? Well, he proceeded from the Father. Okay? He doesn't have a literal physical father here on earth. That's what it says in John 8, verse 42. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. He says, I proceeded forth and came from God. You say, why? Because Jesus is God. Yeah. Okay? That's what the Bible teaches. And he literally was sent by the Father. Okay? He came from heaven. That's where he is today. That's where he was before he came down to earth. Okay? I mean, even, even when he was here, he was up and because obviously God's everywhere. He said that in John chapter 3, that he was everywhere. But what I want you to understand is, Muslims don't even claim that Muhammad proceeded from God. And so if you're going to look at the Bible and take this one verse, John 14, verse 16, and say, well, see, this is referring to Muhammad. Why don't you go to the next chapter where it talks about the Comforter? And it says it's the spirit of truth. Now, no Muslim that you're ever going to meet, as far as I know, is going to claim that Muhammad never told a lie. But if this is the spirit of truth, that means there's no lies. Yes. The spirit of truth, 100% truth. And no Muslim I've ever met is ever going to say that he came from heaven or he proceeded forth literally from God the Father. I've never met one. Maybe there's a small denomination of, of Muslims that would say something like that, but I've never met one. And so how in the world are you going to take our Bible and take one verse completely out of context? And I mean, 
in John 14, turn back to John 14. I don't really know how you go to John 14, verse 16 and walk away and say, well, see, this is Muhammad anyway. I mean, what part of that verse, where does it say that, you know, this person was born in Mecca or whatever? Why would you think this was Muhammad? Verse 16, John 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. When he says comforter, he's referring to the Holy Ghost. Okay? And so when we get saved as believers, we are indwelled with the comforter, the spirit of truth, the Holy Ghost, forever. Okay? Now, people in the Old Testament, though, they were not indwelled with the Holy Ghost. Now, when Jesus was here on earth, it's still technically the Old Testament time period. I understand that the book of Matthew starts the New Testament, but while Jesus was here before he rose again, we're still kind of under the Old Testament. Okay? But Jesus is saying that when I leave, I'm going to send a comforter. The comforter is going to come. Okay? So here's the thing. When they were living at this time, they were not involved with the Holy Ghost. Why? Because Jesus had not sent the Holy Ghost yet. He had to die, be buried, his soul was in hell. And then, once he rose again, the comforter comes. Okay? Jesus is up in heaven, and here's the comforter that indwells us forever. People in the Old Testament, they were not involved with the Holy Ghost. Peter at this time was not involved with the Holy Ghost. None of the apostles were involved with the Holy Ghost at this time. But the Comforter is going to come, and they will be involved with the Holy Ghost. Now, what you do see in the Bible, though, is that in the Old Testament, the Bible talks about the Spirit coming upon someone. Okay? The Bible talks about the Spirit coming upon King Saul quite a bit. It talks about the Spirit coming upon Samson quite a bit. And so you see that people, you know, be they're filled with the Spirit, the Bible says, but they're not involved with the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament. So people in the Old Testament were, were filled with the Holy Ghost. They were filled with the Spirit, but they were not indwelled. So people in the Old Testament, they would be filled with the Holy Ghost. And what you see in the Bible is that when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, it's to do something mighty. Okay? Now, what you have to understand is that being indwelled with the Holy Ghost does not replace being filled with the Holy Ghost. See, people in the Old Testament were not indwelled with the Holy Ghost. They were filled at times. Okay, they get on fire for God, they'd be filled with the Holy Ghost to go soul winning or to fight some mighty battle or, to, or to, to, to preach some sermon. We in the New Testament, we are indwelled with the Holy Ghost, but we can still be filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? Now, if you live a really sinful and wicked life, you're not going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? If you're just disobeying everything God says, you're not going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But what you have to understand is that the comforter indwelling us does not replace being filled with the Holy Ghost. If that replaced being filled with the Holy Ghost, what that basically means is it really doesn't matter if you, you committed some wicked sin like adultery earlier today or whether or not you're reading the Bible. You can still go out soul winning and God's going to use you in the exact same way. That you can still literally just you know commit some terrible sin, deal drugs you know the night before, commit some murder, and step up here to preach. And it's no different from somebody who just was reading the Word of God and praying and living a godly life. Why? Well, because you're both involved with the Holy Ghost. But see, here's the thing. You live that wicked life, you're not going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? But you're living righteously, you will be filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? Now, what you notice when you listen to Baptist preachers, you can often tell if somebody's filled with the Holy Ghost. Or not. When you see pastors who are always really boring, they don't know the Word of God. And honestly, the big thing is when they lack boldness. They have no guts to say what needs to be said. Those people are not filled with yeah. Why? Being filled with the Holy Ghost gives you boldness. Mm -hmm. And so when you see these Baptist preachers that are afraid to preach against the LGBT, they're afraid to just make it clear that you know Catholics are following some false demonic cult. They just won't, they're not willing to say that. It's like just say what needs to be said. They're not even willing to say the Pentecostals are unsaved. They believe you can lose your salvation. You believe some tongue talker is saved. They're not even willing to say what they believe. Even if they believe certain things, they're not willing to say it. Now, that is someone who's not filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is going to give you boldness to do what's right, to say what needs to be said. And when you see people in today's world that have no guts, they're not filled with the Holy Ghost. You say, what about people that you know don't go soul winning because they're shy? Well, they're not filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. This is not meant to insult them, but honestly, if they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they would have boldness to do something that's a little bit uncomfortable. Look, going soul winning is uncomfortable for every single person the first time they do it. It doesn't matter how confident you are. It doesn't matter if you're the most eloquent speaker. Look, I've gone soul winning with people. 
that are new at soul winning, that are just very confident people in their flesh. They're confident. They're a people person. Everybody loves them. And they get to that door, and it's like, hello. It's like, my name's John. And it's like they're really scared, right? And that's not meant to insult them because that's what happens when you first go soul winning. Right. You know, when I first went soul winning, yeah, you know what? I was shy. I was scared. I was worried what was going to happen, okay? But what happens is you're filled with the Holy Ghost and it gives you boldness to do what's right. Yeah. And when you see people that don't have the guts to say what needs to be said, they don't have the guts to stand up for God, they're not filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they're not saved, though. We need to understand the difference between the indwelling of the Holy Ghost and the filling of the Holy Ghost. And we need to understand the importance of the filling of the Holy Ghost because it's going to make you realize the importance of living a godly life. Okay? John 14, verse 17 even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And so once again, this, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the spirit of truth. Verse 18. By the way, Bible commentaries are not the spirit of truth. Yeah. When you read the Bible, you, you have an option of relying on the spirit of truth to teach you, or you can rely on Bible commentaries written by unsaved devils. Mm -hmm. It's up to you. Yeah. Now, I think it makes more sense to rely on the spirit of truth. You say, why is it then that we preach sermons and explain the word of God? You know, what's wrong with Bible commentaries? Because what's the difference? Well, here's the difference because the Bible talks about preaching. Right. Yeah. The Bible speaks about preaching being a good thing. And here's the difference. When you cry aloud and spare not and lift up your voice like a trumpet and show people their transgressions and sins, it causes a change in people. Yeah. That doesn't happen by reading a Bible commentary. See, preaching is something that you see throughout the Bible. You say, what's wrong with Bible commentaries? It's never mentioned as something in the Bible that you use. That's right. Yes, preachers are here to preach the Word of God and to motivate you. And yes, they can teach you stuff. But look, in your personal time, your best source of learning is the Spirit of Truth. Yes. Right, it's the Spirit of Truth. It's perfect. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Okay. Now, I want you to understand something that... The Bible says the Holy Spirit is going to indwell us. And this is another verse one as people would take. Look, just because the Holy Spirit is indwelling us, it doesn't mean that the Lord won't come to us as well. Okay? Jesus Christ is eternal life. Don't you have eternal life abiding in you? Look, just because the Holy Ghost is coming onto us, that does not mean that the Son is not also coming to us. Okay? And so that's something we need to understand because in the Bible sometimes it will talk about the Son doing something and the Holy Ghost and the Father. Like the Bible talks about Jesus rising again from the dead. Jesus said quite clearly in John 2 that he's going to resurrect himself from the dead. Okay? No question about it. That was during the Easter I preached that. And then, you know, there's someone who commented on the video and said, well, you know, actually the Bible talks about, you know, the Father resurrecting or he said the Spirit. I'm like, yeah, I'm not denying that either. That wasn't the point of the sermon, though. The point of the sermon was to highlight how Jesus resurrected himself from the dead. It doesn't change the fact that the Bible also speaks about the Holy Ghost and the Father resurrecting. It's, it's not impossible that they all did it. Okay? Now, does that mean I fully comprehend this? It doesn't mean I fully comprehend this. He says, I will come to you, though. You know, I believe that's true. I will not leave you comfort of this. I will come to you. Verse 19, yet a little while in the world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live, and ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Once again in verse 21, if you have the commandments and keep them, that's the person who loves the Lord. The person who does not keep the commandments of God, they do not love God. Now here's the thing about this. Everybody is going to tell you that they love God. Every single person you talk to. Look, you know, you talk to people out soul winning and you ask them, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Guess what? Most of them don't know. Most of them will admit they don't. Some will lie about it. In reality, very few know. But sometimes people will say they know, and, and then you ask them, you know, well, well how do you know? Paano ka na And it's like, and then they stop, they pause, and it's like, oh, you know, be a mabutu It's like, no, that's, that's not the right answer. <laughs> sometimes they'll lie about it and pretend like they know when they don't know. Okay? But look, every single one of those people, if you ask them, do you love God, they say, oh, I love God. Why? They're basing it on a feeling. Everybody feels like they love God. You love God if you keep his commandments. That's what the Bible says. Now, how in the world can you keep his commandments if you don't know the commandments? Yeah. Right. Most people you preach the gospel to, or just normal, ordinary people you meet, if you ask them to name the Ten Commandments, they would get maybe three or four. That is it. They don't know. And, and 
most of them probably think that there's only ten commandments. <laughs> like they literally think that there are ten commandments God has for you. No, no, God is more than just don't kill people. Right. Yeah. Okay, there's there's a lot of rules about everything. I mean, the book of Leviticus is like a whole book on cleanliness laws. There's rules and laws and commandments on everything. It's a lot more than ten. People have tried to count it. It's like they say it's like around seven hundred or something like that. I don't know. I, I have not taken the time personally to count and to double check if some were the same commandment mentioned multiple times. I have no idea. All I know is there's a lot. Yeah. Okay. But if you don't know the commandments, you can't really say that you're keeping them because you don't even know what you're supposed to do. Verse 22, Judah saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not, in, is not mine, but the father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. I mean, once again, several verses it says that the person who loves God is the person who keeps his words, who keeps his commandments, who keeps his sayings. He says commandments, words, sayings in this chapter. You do not love God unless you're keeping and doing what he tells you to do. Okay, it's just plain and simple. Verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I said on you. Now, I don't know what Muslims think about this verse. Because they think the Comforter is referring to Muhammad. It clearly says the Comforter is the Holy Ghost. Well, if we go back to the Arabic, <laughs> there's just that little, you know, apostrophe. And it's almost like the same word. Like that little apostrophe changes it from the Holy Ghost to Muhammad. Isn't that what people do that make fun of the King James Bible or try to, you know, you look up, you know, Bible contradictions answered by these people. And they say, well, this is a really simple explanation. In the original Hebrew, there was just this little apostrophe or comma, and they obviously forgot it. And when it says 40, it was actually supposed to be 400. It was only off this little comma. They say something, they make it sound like they're really intelligent. It's like, no, there's just no errors in the King James Bible. Right. You're just not smart enough to understand what the Bible's talking about. Amen. It's plain and simple. I don't know what Muslims say to this verse, because they say, well, you know, the Comforter's referring. I guess, I guess the only verse that's inspired by the Bible is... John 14, verse 16, according to Muslim. Every single other verse is mistranslated. John 14, verse 16, though, man, that, that's the one. That <laughs> one's perfect. And the next verse was supposed to say, and by the way, this is referring to Muhammad, who's going to be born in Mecca, and we're going to worship him you know, every single year or whatever. Anyways, verse number 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And see, what the Lord says here is, I give a peace unto you that the world does not give. See, there's a peace of God that passeth all understanding. And the world is never going to understand this. You know, an example I know in my life is when a good friend of mine died when he was 20 years old. I was a college student. I was you know, 22, 23 years old. And, you know, it was just a tragic death. You know, he's someone who loved the Lord. He went soul winning and everything like that. And, you know, at the funeral, me and my friends, you know, and that include Pastor Jason Robinson and, you know, some other people I was friends with, you know, people commented, it's just like, you know, why is it that you guys seem like you're in a good mood and you seem fine? It's just like, we understand heaven. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, was I sad? Absolutely. Were there times that I cried? Yeah, you know, I cried, but my, my friend died. I definitely had some times there where I thought about that and I mourned. But look, there's a peace of God that passes the whole understanding. Right. And honestly believing that heaven's a real place, it's like, you know, if somebody dies that's a believer, it's not the end of the world. Right. It's really not the end of the world. And especially when they're living for God, because if they're living for God, then you know what? We don't know why God allowed them to depart from this world, but they went to be at a better place. Right. So it's like, you know, maybe God allowed them to go to heaven to, to save them from whatever, or maybe God allowed them to go to heaven for whatever reason. We don't necessarily know, but if they're living for God, it's, it's, it's really not tragic. Now, look, does that mean that, that you're not supposed to cry at all? Well, no. I mean, when Lazarus died, didn't Mary and Martha cry? Didn't Jesus cry in that chapter? Didn't Jesus cry? Jesus wept the Bible says. But there's nothing wrong with crying. But look, you know, there's a peace of God that passes all understanding, and the world cannot offer that. They can't give you a peace, the peace that God can give you. Okay? Yes. Verse number 28. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye love me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And so once again, the Father is greater than I. So once again, we're seeing 
a difference there. And he says, if you love me, ye would rejoice. And he's telling them, you know, this, this should not be sad for you, that I'm departing. And yet when Jesus tries to explain about how he's going to die, he gets rebuked by his, by his followers and everything. They're like, no, that's not going to happen to you. It's just like, look, they shouldn't be sad about this. They should be rejoicing. He's saying it's not the end of the world. Okay? Verse number 29. And now I've told you before it come to pass that when it has come to pass, you might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. And so it's a great chapter in the Word of God. There's a lot of great information. We're, we're two-thirds of the way through the book of John. This is really kind of the introduction to the Comforter. The Bible really speaks about the Comforter, the Holy Ghost here. And I guess the thing to take away is this is not Muhammad. Okay, let's yeah. close in a word of prayer.